So we just talked about single species. Now we want to start talking about gaps in knowledge on broader scales. Okay? This is more the, the situation where, you know, Caleb, I appoint you biodiversity czar of Ghana. Okay? Maybe you get a top hat or something. But your job is to complete the knowledge. Okay? Pretty scary job. So you go out and you do your homework, you pull in all of the data that are digital and accessible, maybe you make sure that all of the Ghanaian collections are digitized, maybe you go and battle it out with the collections in Europe and North America and make sure they digitize all their collections, and maybe at the end of the day, you're a herpetologist, maybe you have 200,000 records from your, from your country. And the question is, if you had enough money for one trip, where would you go? If you had enough money for 10 trips, where would you go? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So essentially, this is starting into this question of detecting gaps. And again, Raphael is going to give us kind of a, a more quantitative perspective on it. Uh, but let's start into this, and I think you'll see there's a lot to do, mainly on a visualization level. And I'll go back to one of my favorite examples, where we get these products. In this case, it's biodiversity hotspots. I think I've shown these to you before. Um, this is based on existing knowledge, obviously, but some sort of some sort of, of extension, interpretation, something beyond just the points, okay? And so to give you an example of, of one way this sort of knowledge is generated, uh, you'll see a lot of you know, macroecology analyses of global birds. You know, it might be global bird diversity with respect to net primary productivity. It might be, you know, global bird diversity with respect to seasonality, whatever. The, you know, if you look across the literature, you'll see hundreds of papers of this sort. And a massive amount of that literature, a scary amount of that literature is based on a trick. And that is that bird people love field guides. And when you're looking at your field guide, you want the description, you know, it's a, a small gray bird that is four inches long and flies amongst the rocks or whatever. But also you want your map. And so literally, those maps exist for most bird species on Earth. And there have literally been, I kid you not, efforts to scan these little thumbnail maps and turn them into global bird distributional knowledge. And so I did some, some um, measurements of this particular map. I got kind of irritated one day. And I wanted to see how offensive this was. So this is Greenland. And this is the southern tip of India. Here's Africa and here's Eurasia. And so I measured the distance on this map from the tip of Greenland to the tip of India. I don't know why I did it in inches. I think I was just in a bad mood. No, I know why. See that? 1971 Cincinnati Reds. That was when I was a little kid and the Cincinnati Reds were the greatest baseball team on earth. That ruler, which I still use in my office, is worth quite a bit of money because it was one of the championship teams and it doesn't show any centimeters because the US is rather behind in units of measure. So. One and five eighths inches. And then I measured the distance on the face of the Earth, and it turns out to be 431 million inches. That's a great circle root, so it's the shortest distance. And so the map scale of this map is 1 to 265 million. Okay? So when you then take that and turn that into a GIS data set, the errors involved are simply ridiculous, okay? 
So we really need better distributional information than what we have. And that's kind of the motivating uh, reasoning behind a lot of kind of my playing in these areas. Um, yes, sir. And of course, that map assumes that that distribution is correct. Oh, yeah. And, Which is and we know that this species is not present continuously across all of these regions. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's usually expert drawn. And the experts are experts, and they know what they're doing, but they don't know everything, and they haven't been to every site. And generally what experts do is generalize from ex some experience based at a few sites and guess, educated guess, but it's a guess. So this is kind of the bullshit factor in biodiversity informatics, in macroecology, in conservation. Uh, there's a lot of marketing and there's a lot of bullshit. So what we're after instead, and what we want to base essentially everything that we can on, is primary biodiversity data. So it's got to be in the form of points. They need to be primary in the sense that it is the direct result of an observation of an element of biodiversity. A primary biodiversity data point consists of linking a species or some taxon to a place at a point in time. Okay, very simple. Those three things. The neat thing about the primary data is that it's very abundant. Millions, hundreds of millions of uh, data points are already accessible. Probably on the order of five to 10 billion specimens have been collected. And then the really interesting and useful characteristic of points is that they're essentially dimensionless. And so those point data have no area and they're going to be useful at any spatial resolution that's coarser than the precision with which the point was determined. So unlike that map that I just showed you, we can use the point for a really fine application like here in the fine bows, or we could use it at a continental application. Okay, so that non-dimensionality of points is very useful. This is just for fun, because I took out the Mexican section that Adolfo didn't want me to show you. But this was the last slide in it, and I wanted you to see this. So the question is, can you identify anybody in this picture? Two people. Two people. Who, Jesse? Adolfo. Where is he? Extreme right. That's quite correct. Where? Okay. Last night I was identified as this guy. <laughs> but yeah, that's that was in 1989. Anyhow, that was the fun slide at the end of the Mexico section, which you're not going to see. So let's jump into this project. This is kind of the broadest scale that you can do these projects on. Um, I'm very interested in a concept that I'm calling digital accessible knowledge. And it's essentially the end point of 15 or 20 years of playing with questions of data access, which is to say the whole field, I think, basically understands the need for sharing data. Okay? It's very nice to be able to go on to Google and find the data you want. But at the same time, there are a lot of people out there who don't share their data. Okay? Last week we were talking about data dragons. Because dragons collect treasure, the data. They catalog the treasure, they take care of the treasure, they arrange it, essentially they curate it. But try to take some of that treasure away from the dragon and he breathes fire on you. And there are still some dragons out there. They're getting rarer and rarer. So 
this concept of digital accessible knowledge is basically my statement that if your data are not digitized and being digital if they're not shared openly and freely my assertion is that your data don't exist okay now I know in some cases you know you're working on a specific project and you're writing the paper fine I don't care do you have every intention of depositing those data openly at the end of the process that's my only question but if your data are not digitized and there are a lot of museums around the world that have not prioritized the digitization of their collections and if your data are not accessible openly then my feeling is they don't exist okay that will offend a lot of people and that's okay um, so let's let's examine I've been working on this for about three years let's examine what is inarguably the largest single digital repository or, or portal to digital biodiversity data the GBIF the global biodiversity information facility GBIF currently provides access to data on about 85 million records of birds okay it's by far the best represented taxon um, and if you look at it spatially you get this picture okay and so basically if I look at it from the back of the room what I'm seeing is North America Europe South Africa and Australia pretty well characterized this is representing numbers of of occurrences so I see those four concentrations of data and then everything else looks a little bit more empty but lots and lots of data points don't necessarily make for a good inventory right we talked about that yesterday and we uh, demonstrated that yesterday in our experiment some of you case A and case B with a hundred points were able to characterize your faunas pretty well and some of you with the same sample size didn't even get close so you got to clean up data I did steal these slides from you um, you got to clean up the data quite a bit these are illustrations of all of the different names that refer to this one species okay and so I've cleaned up more than 13 or 14,000 non-standard names now building a library of what does this non-standard name really mean and the best calculation is I have another eight or nine thousand to go so that's two or three months of work um, you need other sorts of cleaning this is all the different kinds of mentions of Mexico that we found in the Atlas data Mexico or USA Mexico DF federal district Gulf of Mexico less than Mexico okay there's a lot of crap in these data and you guys are going to see that as soon as you unzip those files and look at them closely so um, if you look at specimen data of birds this is as of late in 2010 you remember that I pointed out North America Europe South Africa and Australia notice that in this version Australia looks pretty shabby and literally between October 2010 and I think it was early 2012 the Atlas of Living Australia put a huge amount of data online and in that first image I showed you Australia was packed with data so that's one thing that's essentially the last detail that I'm trying to pin down how these things change over time there are the observational data and you can see they're very complementary in some senses look at the southern oceans very sparse specimen records but look at that look at that Kate Kate's, 
Kate's analyzing those data sets for a couple species of albatrosses with respect to environmental and seasonal variation. Um, but essentially what we can see is observational data. It's clear that, that South Africa has done quite a bit with observational data. You see uh, Europe and North America, but the US hasn't really served its big data sets, like our breeding bird survey or our Christmas bird count are not in there. Um, and then there's kind of more sporadic observational data here and there. But huge chunks of the Earth, no observational data. The specimen record is most of what you have to go on. So I had to make early decisions about um, essentially what spatial resolution to do these analyses at. Um, this is a view of simply existence of data at one degree in northeastern U.S. versus at one-tenth degree. Okay, and it's, it's again that Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, this one's a little too soft, and this one's a little too hard, and this one's just right. I eventually settled on one degree resolution because these are global analyses. Um, so, remember those indices we talked about yesterday? I calculated the Chow 2 indicator. The beautiful thing about the Chow 2 indicator is that you don't need estimate S to do it. You can um, fairly easily do it in a spreadsheet or in a database. And so I did all of these analyses in Access. Um, so I started off just saying, okay, what country do the points come from? And I asked, how well is the avifauna, how completely is the avifauna of the country documented? And you see we have a small number of countries that are um, ostensibly well characterized. You know, the large and highly biodiverse country of Belgium is at the, at the forefront. But then you see most of the rest of the countries are very poor in terms of their completeness index. Doesn't mean there aren't data. It means the data are not consistent and um, complete enough to document well the fauna. So now what I'm going to do is show you a bunch of maps where the intensity of the color reflects the completeness index. So for each one of these pixels, I took, I think this is at a tenth degree, I calculated the expected and the observed and I calculated C, and this is C that you're looking at. And so what you can see is that in the US, it's major metropolises that have good complete knowledge. Canada provided access via GBIF to some big observational data sets, and so they have much denser data. But what's the figure? Three quarters of the population of Canada is in is within 100 kilometers of the, of the US border, something like that. So you can see that the sampling effort goes to very nil as you go farther north. Most of the US is without good knowledge. There's Lawrence, Kansas, so you can see the effects of the KU Natural History Museum and the birders who hang out around the University of Kansas. 